we'll start. Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to Whitmix's webinar from Design to Print Bite Splints. This webinar offers one credit hour toward your, res your recertification, uh, your CDT renewal. You'll receive a thank you letter follow up uh, once we finish the webinar, which will have a little short test. And uh, you'll just have to answer those test questions, send it in to us, and then we'll give you a certificate. We'll send you a certificate that you can send to the NBC with your renewal forms. So uh, by the way, please submit any questions you have during the presentation. You, you won't have access to uh, verbal, but at least uh, if you can type in your questions, uh, we'll save them and answer them all at the end. So our presenters today are Sherry Weatherby and Bryce Hiller. I, I'm willing to bet that most of you uh, know both of, the, of our presenters. Sherry is a territory sales manager at Whitmix. She focuses on sales efforts of the Whitmix and Dental Technology Solutions products and services in the Southern half of the US. And Sherry has over 25 years in the dental industry as a lab technician, retail, direct and manufacturing sales. Our second pre presenter is, is Bryce Hiller. Bryce has an associate's degree in information sciences from Indiana Wesleyan University and received his lab experience from his family lab where he was instrumental in transitioning the lab from analog to digital. Originally a technician at Ford, Ford's Dental Lab in Nelsonville, Ohio, he now specializes in three-shape design, three, 3D printing and milling. With a passion for helping labs and practices transition from analog to digital workflows, Bryce's goal is to foster innovation and empower professionals in the dental industry with various CAD CAM and digital manufacturing technologies. Bryce is now a member of Whitmix's marketing team. So in this webinar, Bryce and Sherry will demonstrate and discuss the design and manufacturing of digital bite splints using Three Shape Splint Studio, software along with tips and tricks for nesting and 3D printing on the Acida 3D printer. So please join me in welcoming Sherry and Bryce. Thanks guys. Thanks Bernie. Good morning everybody. Um, so Bryce is actually gonna go through the design process in 3Shape software for Splint Studio. Um, Splint Studio is available in the 3Shape uh, premium software package as well as the complete restorative software package. If you do have the basic Crown and Bridge package, you can add Splint Studio onto the um, on, onto your software package, um, including uh, the ortho the uh, ortho system premium. So from there, he's going to then show you how to properly nest a splint. Um, we're going to be showing that with the Composer software for the Sega Max printer. Um, with that being said. You can actually nest, um, you can actually 3D print a splint in about 20 to 25 minutes at a 100 micron layer thickness on the Asiga Max um, at a cost of about $4.20 a splint. So it's actually a very profitable um, item to be printed in house. So from there, we will then discuss proper post processing using approved curing lights. So with that being said, Bryce, go ahead and take it over and we'll get started with 3Shape. Awesome. Well, hi everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us today, this morning. Um, so yeah, like Sherry said, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go over some bite splint design in 3Shape uh, software. Um, and I have a, a, a personal vendetta against PowerPoints, so we're not doing a PowerPoint. It's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be all, all live demonstration. So uh, we're just going to go ahead and we're going to jump in. And if you don't see me looking at the cameras, because I've actually, I'm actually working on two different computers here. I've got one for my camera and one for um, uh, my actual uh, design PC. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so everybody should be able to see yep, my uh, three shape demo system software. Um, so Splint Studio, um, we're gonna actually, we're gonna order it in our dental system, but Splint Studio is actually housed in Three Shapes Trios slash dental desktop software. Um, but it's really easy to link those two things together. Um, if you need to link those, like if, if you currently have Three Shape and they're not already linked, just open up your control panel and go into your system settings right here. And if you scroll down to the installation file path for Splint Studio, you'll see right here, 
just type this in C uh, program files three shape dental desktop and that will um, allow you to order your split order in your um, dental system and then when you actually like click on the design button it'll jump jump you over to the actual split studio module if you don't do this you actually have to order it in dental desktop so it's just kind of like a quality of life thing <clears throat> okay so we're gonna go ahead and order our splint so i'm gonna start a new order uh, you're gonna fill out all of your normal information um patient patient information whatnot um, to order a splint, you can just select any tooth on the maxillary arch and select down here where it says appliance. And then the first default option here is splint. <laughs> uh, over here, if we hover over this read plus symbol, uh, we can specify our material. I'm just going to choose model material. You can choose a shade if you want, but since the splint, it's not really super relevant. Um, and then finally, um, we want to adjust um, our object, object type. If you're going to be scanning this in, then you'll leave it on model. I'm going to be importing uh, intraoral scans, so I'm going to choose digital impression. Click OK. Uh, here's the order we just created. I'm going to right click, and we're going to go ahead and import our scans. thinking about it. All right, I've got my splint scans already pulled up here and saved. When you're importing the scans, you want to be careful um, and pay attention to exactly which scan is asking for. Usually it will ask for the upper first, but sometimes 3Shape can switch up the order on you. Um, so just make sure you're actually choosing uh, whichever one it's asking for here on this like title bar on this window. So we're going to select the upper. <clears throat> it's going to prompt us again for the antagonist. Okay. Um, now that our scans are imported, I can see them down here in our preview window. Uh, all I need to do at this point, since we linked in our control panel, um, to Splint Studio, I'm just going to right click and then there, there will be a Splint Studio option right here. It's going to go ahead and it's going to open up the Trios slash dental desktop software. Okay, um, so the nice thing about Dental Desktop <clears throat> is it pretty much tells you what to do. Uh, when 3Shape um, like redesigned the Splint Studio software, um, they made it really, really easy to get from literally like the beginning of your design where we are now to the end in very, very few clicks. <clears throat> so even though I'm going to elaborate on everything like um, quite a bit, uh, it's actually like super fast to get from point A to point B. I'm just going to spend time going over everything. Um, Typically on each screen, you're going to see little like hints right here. This is pretty much what the software is telling you to do. So right now I can see um, in our, uh, our, the first step here, um, it's asking us to click on tooth number 16 on the mesial lingual cusp. So um, it's saying 16 because I haven't changed the notation. It's set to FDI, but really it's, it's it would be what, number three. Um, so I'm going to click on our mesial lingual cusp. Now it's going to ask for basically where the midline is. And then over here it's 26. So what we're doing here is we're actually setting this occlusal plane. Now if you accidentally put the dots in the wrong spot, it's not a huge deal. You can actually just pick these things up and move them around. Or you can use these control handles to just do it, uh, to just move that um, occlusal plane manually. Pretty, uh, pretty simple. Uh, the other thing you're gonna need, gonna need to do is choose a machine and material. Um, the reason that we do this in Splint Studio is because 
Um, different resin manufacturers have different design parameters that are preloaded into the software. So for example, um, on the Asiga Max printing, um, today we're gonna choose the Keystone Splint Soft Resin. Um, that resin has uh, set by Keystone um, preset manufacturing settings um, and design settings for a split. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and choose that. If we, if we go back here, you can see there's all kinds of different um, manufacturers with mach different machines and different resins. Um, but we're gonna go with Asiga because they are the best. And uh, yeah, we'll go, on, go ahead and continue from here. Um, we have the occlusal plane set. That's the main step here um, on this screen. And I'm gonna go ahead and click next. Um, so this is the byte configuration stage. So basically what we need to do here, um, is several things, you can analyze the byte, make sure it's correct. Um, and then the big thing that we need to do is we need to actually open up that byte to accommodate the splint. Uh, it's super easy to do that right here where it says ensure space for splint thickness of. Um, this is where we wanna set how thick we want the posterior of that splint to be, the minimum thickness. So for Keystone, it's already loaded in at 1.6. Um, if you wanted to, to beef that up at all, you can increase it. Um, I don't recommend going below the manufacturer setting. Um, it, the appliance could theoretically break um, because it's not strong enough at that thickness. <coughs> but since Keystone goes with uh, 1.6 millimeters, we're just gonna leave it right, leave it right there. Um, if we want to just take a look at the byte and uh, the excursive movements of that byte on the virtual articulator, I can click this, this uh, play button right here that says run articulation. And it's just gonna go ahead and it's gonna run, uh, run these, the, the lower jaw through lateral and protrusive movements. Um, if we want to kind of expand on that, uh, what we can do, this little uh, select motions to perform button up here, I can click that. And then I can actually add in kind of like canine guidance movements as well. So now if I run the play button, now it's gonna run more excursive movements. And everything is color coded, which is really nice. You can see exactly where, uh, which, um, kind of which movement is uh, hitting. <clears throat> you can turn those off, you know, by opening that and, and just clicking on those arrows again very easily. Um, so what we need to do to actually open up this byte is this little button right here is actually, if I click that, it's going to go ahead and open the jaw to accommodate this value thickness in the posterior regions. So the anterior is going to be more open than 1.6, uh, but the posterior, we need to make sure has that, has that thickness. Um, now, before we move on, before we click next, we need to actually go ahead and lock this. So there's a lock jaw position right here. Now, fortunately, uh, Splint Studio doesn't even allow you to proceed without locking. In previous versions, a, a common mistake, if you are on an older version, um, you need to make sure you click the lock button because it doesn't do it automatically. And if you go ahead and, and click the next button and proceed, um, the, the jaw will not be open to accommodate your splint. So always make sure that you go ahead and you click that lock jaw position button. Um, so now we're in the blocking out phase. Um, again, the manufacturer is going to automatically set the retention setting. Uh, we're gonna talk in just a sec about what that setting actually does because there's a lot of confusion around what it does. Um, so on our actual uh, preparation arch, the arch where we're creating our splint, um, we can see we have a like a blue color coded kind of heat map. Uh, what this heat map is showing is the depth of undercut based on the path of insertion that we have set. So this green arrow right here is showing our actual path of insertion for our appliance. Uh, the software does a pretty darn good job of giving you a, a good path of insertion. Um, if you want to change that, it's very easy. Um, the, um, the best way to do it is to like go to a, an occlusal view of where you want that path of insertion to be, and then you can click the right here, this from view button. It will automatically snap to that new path of insertion and it's gonna update the, the heat map for those uh, for those undercuts. If you want to revert back to the automatic uh, placement of that um, insertion direction, we just click the auto button 
and it'll snap you right back to where it was originally. <clears throat> but what we can see here in these lighter colors, these are less intense undercuts. And then as, as, as the blue color gets darker and darker, we're getting to more and more severe undercuts. Uh, over here, we have a, a, a checkbox uh, for perform undercuts removal. If you don't want to automatically apply any block out wax, just leave that unchecked. If you want to do everything manually or you don't want any at all, leave that unchecked. If you want the software to automatically apply block out wax, we're going to select that. And then from there, what the software is going to do is it's going to take into account these two values right here. The first one is retention. So what retention is going to do is any undercuts that are greater than one millimeter, it's going to block them out. So that's why you can see here all these undercuts that are less than one millimeter deep. There's no block out wax being applied. Now, if we start decreasing, actually, I don't even know if it'll, it may lock it. Yeah, it's going to lock it based on the manufacturer's specifications. So you can't even decrease it. Let's see if you can't increase. You can't increase it either. So you are locked into that retention amount based on the manufacturer. Now, the other thing that it's going to do, and this you can change, is the block out angle. So if we set this to one degree, what the software is going to do, it's going to give you basically an extra an, an extra degree um, of block out wax. Uh, based on, and, it, and it's based on that insertion direction. So it's going to basically flare out an extra degree or whatever value you set here for block out angle. <clears throat> so that is, that's one way you can, you know, sneak a little bit more block out wax if you want um, in kind of an automated fashion. Um, but we're going to go ahead and uh, once it's done calculating this, this wax up, uh, I'm going to click next. And this is going to take us to the next step, which allows us to <coughs> uh, manually uh, sculpt our block out wax. So what you may want to do is here in these interproximal areas, you may want to add, I'm going to click our add button right here. You may want to add a little bit extra block out wax just to, to create a little bit of relief, less pressure in these areas. Again, this, this all comes down to, this all comes down to preference and you know, what you're accustomed to doing, what you prefer to do, what your doctor likes, what the patient might like. Um, so this is all, you know, this is all up to you, but it is nice to be able to manually add this block out wax. If you've used either the partials module or the dentures module in three shape, um, you're already familiar with this. Um, you can also remove. So if there are certain areas you wanted to get rid of block out wax, you can do that as well. And then you can smooth, you can smooth out too. There's a smoothing tool. So it makes everything nice and buttery smooth on that surface so you don't get any kind of like jagged edges on the inside of your appliance. Uh, if, you, if you need to change the size of the brush, you see that little circle? Um, that's the size of your brush. Over here there's a slider. You can actually increase that size and make it like really big. I don't know why you would ever want it that huge, but you can do it if you want to. Um, you can also change the intensity or the strength of that brush with this, uh, with the second slider bar right here. So if I click on add, now I'm adding like a ton of block out wax, totally natural, and you definitely totally want to do that. Just kidding. Um, but you can, you, you know, you can change the intensity, you can change the size of that brush to accommodate your needs. You can see here again, we have this little hints window that's basically telling us what to do. So it's letting us know you can adjust the virtual wax with our uh, wax knife, which for some reason the icon is a spray can for a wax knife. Don't ask me why. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so once we are done applying our, um, our block out wax, oh, so for example, back here, you may want to add a little bit, a little bit of block out wax, just on some of these rough areas. And then we may come back with our smoothing tool and just smooth that out a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click next. So now we're actually ready to draw our um, our splint outline, as you can see um, on this icon right up here. Um, so there's a couple different ways you can draw the splint outline. I prefer to click and drag my mouse, but you can also like do single clicks. But I'm going to click and drag just because I find it to be I find it to be easier. So you can start anywhere; it doesn't matter where you start. So I'm just going to click and drag. Now this doesn't have to be perfect right away. We can come back and we can adjust this.
there's a lot of different opinions, philosophies on how to where, where you want this border to be on your splint. We're not going to get into all that because that really is more of a matter of opinion for the most part. So we're going to draw this border simply by clicking and dragging. And then once I get back to kind of like where I started, I'm just going to single click on that first point and it is going to uh, complete that line. Now from here, if I want to make any adjustments, for example, if I wanted to bring this line up in sizely a little bit and then bring it down and then drop it down a little bit on that canine, you know, I'm just clicking and dragging to redraw that line. So you can always come back and make any adjustments. <clears throat> so for example, if I wanted to maybe make that a little bit more comfortable, just in case it, that's a, a point of friction, we can do that. And if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to go ahead and type those questions in the chat box and um, we'll address those here in a little bit. Okay, so once we, uh, once we have our, our line drawn, um, there are a couple a uh, couple of split design settings over here, but again, these are going to be locked. So I don't, I, I will talk about them just so everybody knows what they are, uh, but these are going to be locked by the manufacturer anyway. Splint thickness, you know, probably self-explanatory. That's the minimum thickness of your splint. <coughs> um, the offset from the teeth to splint, that's essentially like your cement gap, if you will. Um, it's, a, it's just a little bit of buffer in between your design and your teeth, just so that there's, you can actually get the, the thing seated, right? Um, and then drill diameter, um, this is gonna be set to zero, zero if you're 3D printing. Um, this is basically your drill radius if this were going to be a milled appliance um, because you have to accommodate that physical tool that's going in and milling everything out. Um, so the drill diameter is what controls that. But again, since we're printing and we're using Keystone's um, uh, design parameters, these are all locked anyways. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna click next over here. So now we're gonna actually um, kind of define what kind of function we want on um, uh, on this design. So uh, we, I can see here we have three different options for um, function. Uh, the first one is raised to antagonist cusp tips. Uh, the second one is raised to antagonist plane, and the third one is raised ramp. Um, so more often than not, more I, I would say uh, what I find the, the most common preference is going to be in the posterior regions to do a raise to antagonist, antagonist cusp in the posterior. And then uh, I'm going to hide this preview because it's kind of annoying. Um, and then so we're going to do that in the posterior regions. And then what we can do, we can go back over here to this little menu. I can click raise ramp. And we're gonna define that for our anterior teeth, for that anterior guidance. <clears throat> now you can, um, you can modify this ramp angle if you want, if you want it to be uh, a, a, a steeper ramp or a more like, not steep ramp, what's the opposite of steep? <laughs> um, you can also uh, follow the cusp radius right here. So this basically, if you follow the cusp radius more, it's basically going to, for lack of better terms, that that those antagonist cusps are going to lock in more with that splint. Um, so you can you have full control over that as well, um, depending on on how much, I guess, inter, interlocking you want on those posterior teeth. So um, now we're really kind of in the final design phase. Um, so we can see that it automatically generated our splint based on those parameters that we've already set. Um, I can see we have one alert here and it's letting us know that there is an area of our design that is thinner than the recommended and is quite a bit, it's five tenths of a millimeter too thin. That's pretty significant. We're gonna to want to adjust that, but we're gonna wait until the very end because we're gonna make some modifications to this anyways. So we're gonna wait until the end to worry about that validation. <laughs> Take a look at our screen here. A couple things to point out. Um, we do have a nice uh, heat map of our occlusion. 
and we have a corresponding chart over here. So anything, um, anything like orange, yellow, green is out of occlusion, so approaching occlusion. And then as we get into red, blues, and then whatever that turquoise color is, the, uh, we're, this is all going to be positive contact. Um, <clears throat> and we do have a couple of nice little indicators here as to where certain um, contact points are. So I can see we're you know 20 microns, we've got 60 microns back here, 40 microns, uh, we got a lot right there, 110 microns, 120 microns, that's pretty heavy um, uh, of contact. Uh, I'm gonna show you how we can adjust all of those. It's very, very easy. There's a couple different ways we can do it uh, that we're gonna get into. Um, we also have right here, we have a minimum thickness setting. That's very important. So I can see the areas exactly where this validation is alarming us to. So I can see a spot right here, spot right here, and a spot right here. <coughs> I'm not gonna worry about manually increasing those because we're just gonna, we're, at the end of our design, I'm gonna click the correct button. It's gonna automatically snap those up to our minimum. <clears throat> um, I can toggle on and off our antagonist up here. If I want to see that antagonist arch, I can kind of toggle on and off our actual splint. So Bryce, um, somebody wanted to know, can they design a splint with anterior teeth in contact? Um, can you design a splint with the anterior teeth in contact? I'm not sure how that would work. Um, Cause you're gonna need to open the bite to allow any room for, for a splint and if the teeth are in, I, I don't know. I'm not, I, I need more information. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so what we're going to do now is um, let's talk about how we can kind of morph this to our particular patient's um, excursive movements. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn on the antagonist, and for the sake of demonstration, we'll turn on our virtual articulator as well. Uh, you can turn on the, artic the articulator right here on this little toggle switch right, right over here on the, on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, so we have a few different options for uh, our virtual articulator. Um, right here, the play button, this is just going to run the articulation. It's not going to make any adjustments. It's just it's strictly visual. Then if I turn off, I can see... Where those um, where those excursive movements um, are are taking place. Um, a couple things that we can do. Uh, this button down here, this adapt. So if you hover over, it says adapts the design using the full motion. So if I click that, it's going to run those excursions and then automatically adjust these areas of contact. So I'm going to do that. Now watch these areas right here. So now you can see these areas got, got kind of scooped out like with an ice cream scoop. And it automatically made those adjustments. Um, however, you know, this area right here, we probably don't really want to adjust. I mean, maybe you do, um, but if you don't, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna reset. And I'm gonna undo. So I'm gonna undo that those changes we just made. And then this button down here, what we can do here, if I click this, I can lock that anterior region by simply clicking and dragging around that spot. And now when I adapt the design, it's basically going to ignore that and it's going to preserve all that data and it's only going to adjust anything that's not highlighted, which can be really, really useful because there are some areas that you're probably not going to want to adjust, um, especially if they're thin or if they're in like key functional areas. <clears throat> um, and again, in our virtual articulator, we can click this select motions to perform, and then we can either toggle on and off uh, specific movements. So if we want full range, we can turn everything on. <coughs> and then it'll make those adjustments if there were any more to be made. <clears throat> so now we probably want to address um, our areas of minimum thickness. A couple ways we can do this. 
Uh, the easy way is to simply uh, click the correct button. It's going to automatically snap these areas up into the minimum thickness of, in this case, 1.6 millimeters. So you can see it went ahead and just snapped those up. Um, however, there are manual ways you can do this if you don't like the way that it does that because it will create just like a kind of like a little bubble right there on that spot. Um, we can also do it manually with both our wax knife and our morphing tool. So the wax knife is uh, the same exact thing as what we just saw with our block out wax. So I can click the add button. And I can go in here and I can just go ahead and manually kind of beef these areas up. I can change the size of that brush. I'm holding the, the shift key. It's a, it's a nice little keyboard shortcut. I'm holding shift and using my scroll wheel. So if I want to get super precise, I can bring these areas up. Then I can come back and I can smooth them out a bit. Now, Bryce, once someone is fully trained with doing splint design, um, how quickly would you say they could get through a design uh, typically? Five minutes. Five minutes? Yeah, it's, it, yeah. like I said at the beginning, I'm going through every single feature um, of the software and I'm explaining everything kind of like, you know, somewhat in depth. What's your question? I mean, it's literally like, it's five minutes. You can, you can have a splint if you, you know, if you're proficient, you can have a splint in like 10, 20 clicks. I mean, it, it's, it's crazy fast. Um, the old, I hope three shapes not listening. The old appliance designer, I was not a fan of. <laughs> no, right. it, it was just, it was really, really cumbersome. Um, it was, it was overly, it, it was overly complicated. Uh, they released the Splint Studio, I think maybe like, maybe two years ago now, maybe three. No, I think it was like two years ago. Yeah. Um, and it, huge improvement, uh, huge improvement over, over the previous generation of software. And yeah, it's, it's super fast. Like literally like five minutes, you can, you can be ready to print. It's super quick. Uh, did I see we got a, a question that came in, Sherry? Yeah, so if, if you thicken deficient areas, is the software thickening the entire occlusal? No, just that area, just that area. So, um, you know, we go over here to this area that was, actually I'll just take it down just, so I'm using my wax knife, it's just that spot. And if I do the automatic correction, it's only snapping up those areas to the minimum thickness. It's not, it's not doing any kind of global, global increase of the thickness or anything like that. It's just, it's just those spots. Good question. And here's another one. Um, let's see, Marius said, opening, opening of the bite on the virtual articulator is based on average settings and values. Is it better for the doctor to scan the open bite in the mouth using a spacer to ensure the bite is open and the correct interocclusal uh, inter relation. You can certainly do that. Um, the only thing I would caution you of is make sure that it's open enough for whatever material material you're using. Um, that's that's really the key. That's what you have to be careful of. Can you do that? Absolutely, and and you can import you can import that position um, on its own basically. Um, but you can do that. Uh, you just you just have to be aware of that that minimum thickness value. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I saw another comment that came in. Let me see what that was. Yeah, something from George um, talking about thickening uh, the deficient areas. Um, He's saying that uh, the splints occlusion would be incorrect. How are you adjusting for that? Or when yeah. are you adjusting for it? I mean, that, that's uh, a little bit unavoidable. Um, I mean, you can, you can leave the material below that minimum thickness, um, but you are risking, and depending on how much it is, like if, it, if we're talking like 10 microns, then I'm, I'm just going to leave it. But if we're talking like 150 microns, you may want to split the difference. Um, I mean, you, you definitely want to be you definitely want to be careful with going below the manufacturer's minimum thickness recommendations. It's just an unfortunate reality. And an earlier question: um, somebody wanted to know, uh, like, if the splint is too loose, at what stage do you actually, or too tight, at what stage do you make those adjustments? But um, that's going to be post-processed, correct? 
Um, well, no, I mean, it, it really depends. Um, depends when you say it's too tight. I mean, there's, there's different things you want to, you want to look for. Um, you, what you can do again, some of these settings are locked by the manufacturer. So, you know, my instinct is to go to the retention value, but you know, if you choose Keystone, for example, that value is locked. So you can't really do anything about it. Now, what, uh, what you can do, if it's, if it's, if it seems like it's tight in certain areas, I would go back to the wax trimming step and see if you can kind of artificially increase, um, that retention amount, or I guess decrease technically, um, by adding or maybe even smoothing out, um, some of the blockout wax. Uh, that's probably the place to start. Um, but when you talk about fit, it's, it's, it's hard to give like a set answer because there are a lot of different factors that can affect that fit. Um, and, and like you said, Sherry, it could be post-processing. Um, the post-processing um, uh, could affect the fit, the cure, um, even the wash. If, you, if, it's, if you don't have an adequate wash, that can absolutely, um, that can absolutely affect um, uh, the fit. So. Uh, several different things you could try there. It really comes down to pin, pinpointing where that where those fit issues are are being introduced. Sorry, I got a little distracted. Somebody just somebody just delivered uh, so my somebody just delivered a package to my door. Probably a Christmas present. Let's be real. So I'm like sitting here watching like this UPS guy. Like, okay, you're gonna leave my, it. Let's run after you. <laughs> yeah, my bedroom looks like Amazon right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so back in our design here, um, once you have, you know, your thickness settings, your your basic function design set up, um, oh, actually, I want to talk about this morphing tool, because this is pretty cool as well. Um, we have a free morphing tool here, which is pretty neat. Uh, what you can do here, there's two options, there's free morphing and directional morphing. Uh, free morphing basically allows you to just, like, pick up this, this um, data, essentially, and just kind of move it around. Uh, directional morphing allows you to do the same thing just on a single axis. So it's, again, just one more way that you can basically uh, morph your design, adjust your design. <clears throat> so for example, this area right here, I might want to beef up just a little bit. <clears throat> Well, considering you're doing that, this question um, that came in a minute ago is actually a good time to ask. So when you add for areas of minimum thickness, how do you maintain a balance centric as well as excursive? When you add for areas of minimum thickness, how do you maintain a balance centric as well as excursive? Um, you know, what What you might want to do, if, if, you're, if you're really, if you have areas that are really, really below minimum thickness, what you may want to do is go back to your um, uh, your bike configuration stage and open it up just a little bit more, um, maybe another tenth of a millimeter to accommodate that, depending on how severe it is. That's probably the best way I would handle it. Again, you are somewhat limited because a lot of these settings are locked by the manufacturer, um, but that is one that you can control. You can you can open up that bite a little bit more if you need to. Um, so that's probably the route that I would go. Um, once we have our design kind of where we want it, um, we can click this next button. And uh, this is actually a new feature. We have the option to add an ID tag. So if I click the add button, we can name this pretty much whatever we want. Uh, we're just gonna call this John Doe, I guess. Uh, click this add button right here. You can change the size if you want it to be like really big or really small or kind of in the, in the middle. Um, so we'll rotate around kind of to where we want that. And I wonder if we can, oh, I'm going to get rid of that. It's too long. And Bryce, uh, we have another question from Manuel. He wants to know, can you create a design with your own settings as an example without Keystone undercut settings? No. Um, three shape is really strict about it. I wish you could, that'd be nice. Um, but they have, they actually have like a pretty rigorous qualification process, um, to add in new machines and, and new materials. Um, but what you can do, um, 
you can go back to where you're when you choose the machine and material you can play around and see if there are other resins that if you have like a certain material that you're using or wanting to use um, you can go back and look at the settings for the other resins and manufacturers and see if they correspond with your manufacturers settings um, chances are there's something that's going to be pretty darn close um, so that's kind of a little workaround but no you can't you can't put in your own custom ones at this point um, yeah they they kind of they kind of lock that stuff down uh, pretty pretty tight I would assume that's probably because it's an FDA approved material and a class two medical device, right, Bryce? Yeah, it all has to do with the 510K. So the software, when it comes to a 510K classification for a class two medical device, the software is included in that, um, as you know, Sherry. Um, so that that's that's really why. So I, I don't even I don't anticipate them ever allowing you to do anything custom setting settings wise because then you're basically, they're allowing you to use their software to create non-compliant devices, which they're just not gonna, they're not gonna do because that makes them liable to some extent. <clears throat> so once we uh, slap the OID tag on there, we, uh, we can go ahead, it's gonna calculate and it's gonna give us that validation issue again, 50 microns, but that, would, that happened when we applied the ID tag. I'm not really worried about that at all. So I'm just going to click accept <laughs> and accept it as is. And then I'm going to click next. And next here is actually save and close. Um, while it's doing that, Bryce, um, are there other options for the virtual articulator in 3Shape? Like, can someone switch it to a Dan uh, Denar Mark 330 or other options? There in dental system there are so we have our our three hundred series uh, Denar articulator and there, uh, as well as like I think maybe six or seven other ones um, are 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 pre calibrated in there as well uh, but in dental desktop there's only one right now um, I I would anticipate more being added down the road but right now there's just there's just the one in in the actual Splint Studio uh, so here's our our design Splint. So now we need to actually go ahead and export it out. So I'm gonna simply click the case. I'm gonna push F7 on my keyboard. That's gonna export the STL file out. Not responding, that always inspires confidence. Well, while it's thinking, um, let's do another question. Can the three shape splint studio be used to make other types of splints such as mouth guards, um, medicament splints, x-ray splints, or is it limited to just occlusal splints at this time? Um, it's mostly, I mean, you could you could probably technically do a mouth guard um, by adjusting your spline line and you could probably make that work. Um, but for the most part, it, right now, it's just gonna be, for the most part, occlusal splints um, at this point. Will they add more features in the future? Uh, I'm, I'm sure they will. So I'm gonna go ahead and open, good question. I'm gonna go ahead and open that file path. So here I can see our STL file for that splint. And now we're actually ready to pull this into <clears throat> our nesting software. So we're gonna be um, demonstrating the nesting in a Sega's Composer software. So this is a software that is included with the purchase of an Asiga Max or Pro 4K 3D printer. Best printers on the market, hands down. Uh, they are fantastic. Um, so I'm going to actually just copy this file path so I don't have to dig for it in a minute. While, so, you're, doing, while you're doing that, um, someone else just asked, is it possible to create a hard soft splint with the soft layer contacting the teeth with the outer hard layer of resin? So right now that process is not FDA approved. Can it be done? Technically, yes, if the printer, such as the Asiga, um, you can tell it to say, let's say there's 100 layers and you want it to stop at layer 50 and swap out materials. Technically, that's something you could do, but it's not an FDA approved process. So legally, no, you cannot. Officially, the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, this is our Asiga Composer software. Um, 
uh, it's pretty easy to use. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to get from point A to point B. Um, really what I want to show is the proper nesting technique, how, like kind of how you want this thing ori oriented on your build plate. Now I will say this does vary, again, this varies by manufacturer. So you, whatever resin you're using, you want to check the IFU for that resin. It should tell you how, like how to position this, where to, where to put the supports, um, and, and kind of how to orient this in your print space. Most of them are going to be very, very similar. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and we'll show you that. Uh, I'm going to set up a new print job. Now I'm just going to select a virtual machine. I don't actually have, a, unfortunately, a printer here at, at home, which is where I am right now. Um, wish I did. Um, and we're going to choose, uh, we'll just choose Ver our, our Verisplint OS just because that's what I have loaded in here. Um, and the, 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 the important thing here is your slice thickness. Um, almost anything that I print, I'm printing at either 50 or 100 microns. Um, things that I'm going to print at 50 are going to be like implant models, crown and bridge models, like with removable dies, um, any kind of temporary crown, um, or splint. I'm actually going to go ahead and, I'm going to print our splint at 100, uh, 100 microns. It will be, will be plenty accurate enough for a bite splint. So I'm going to choose 100 microns. I'm going to click OK. So I'm not going to go through every feature of this of this software simply because it's already 11:47. I'm rambling, um, and um, it's not necessarily relevant for you know. Um, if you buy the CD, you'll get that in training. So um, <clears throat> we're just I'm just going to show you basically how to import and how to orient it and um, where you want the supports to be. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add in our splint. I do see a question. Are you recommending doing splints modelless, or do you recommend printing models and mounting to check occlusion slash excursions? Um, <laughs> that's really, really a preference thing. That's really a comfort thing for you. Um, more and more labs are definitely going modelless, both with stuff like this and Crown and Bridge. Um, I have the confidence in the design and the printing with Three Shape and Asiga. I have the confidence to go modelless personally. I do, um, but not everybody does, and that's that's okay. If you want to print models and you want to articulate, do it. Go for it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing that, um, and you may even want to do that just for your doctor's peace of mind. Um, I, I think there's definitely a psychological thing there where you just feel more at ease um, when you have that model. Um, so you know, really, that that's preference. Um, now, is it? Again, is the technology capable of going fully modelless? 100%. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I'm not going to recommend one over the other. Uh, it really comes down to, to your comfort level. All right, so let's grab that STL file. It's going to make me go find it. It is. Fine, I will. Right here. Okay, here's our SCL file. So I'm going to open that file. So I can see it went ahead and imported that. This is not the correct orientation um, that we want to print this at. So um, actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to select it, and I'm just going to rotate this bad boy around. And I can see here, I can see what degree basically this is being rotated. And I'm going to print this thing. It again it depends on the manufacturer, but typically it's going to be um, it's going to be anywhere between like 20 to 45, or maybe even 60 degrees, depending on the resin manufacturer. And um, we're going to print this with the anterior side down uh, for several reasons. Um, uh, the first reason is the number of supports. It will require far fewer supports, and the supports are going to go on the occlusal. You do not want to print the supports on the intaglio. It, it, you're never going to get the thing to fit because all of these occlusal nooks and crannies are going to have support little support nubs in there, and you're never going to get them all out. And if you do, your splint's going to be really, really loose. <clears throat> so you're going, to, you're going to support this on the occlusal surface with the anterior side down. 
uh, both for the stability of the print, the accuracy of the print, and the uh, minim minimizing the number of supports that are necessary. Um, to add our supports, I'm going to open up our supports window. I'm simply going to click apply. <clears throat> These support settings are all going to be imported uh, based on the resin that you choose when you set up your print job. So all these will be, uh, all these settings are automatically uh, imported. So from here, you can see our supports have been added. It's really not a bad number of supports. It's pretty good. It's not, it's not too, uh, too intrusive. And this is going to be really easy to clean up in post-processing. And from here, it's ready to send to the printer. Um, for the sake of time, we only have not, not eight, nine minutes. We're not going to send this to a printer just because it, you know, it, it's, that's very uh, not necessary for this. So um, what I want to talk about now is post-processing. Uh, I want to make sure we touch on that. Um, so and this is going to be true of just about any 3D printer. Um, what your post-processing is going to look like after your print is complete, um, you're going to use, I use like a little, like, like a razor blade, like a paint razor to pop these off the build plate. And then it, it's going to go into an isopropyl alcohol wash. Um, you want to do a dual stage wash. Now we do sell a wash unit it's called the Vera Whirl. It's an awesome little unit. It works a lot better than ultrasonic cleaners, which is what I, before, you know, I, I got the 3D printing kind of like towards the beginning of it. And no one had like a, like an actual wash unit. And we were all just like using these little like ultrasonic cleaners. They don't do a great job. Um, it's not, it's not a good cleaning mechanism. I mean, it, it worked for the, you know, back then, but um, now we have a, a really, really nice wash unit. It's not very expensive at all. Um, and it's a dual chamber wash unit. Um, and it's, again, it's called the Vera Whirl. Um, works really, really well. Um, you're gonna do five minutes in a dirty wash and then five minutes in a clean wash. Um, so it's a two stage, it's a two stage wash, um, just to make sure you get all of that residue, all that, that uncured resin off of that surface. You have to do that, especially on the intaglio, because if you don't, if there's still resin, once it goes into the final cure, that's going to get cured on there and it's going to affect your fit and your fit and function. Um, so you want to make sure you are taking this through a proper wash cycle. And you uh, also want to make sure that you're using a clean batch of isopropyl alcohol for each batch of splints that you wash um, because it is a class two medical device. If that extra residue is in there, um, it's not going to post process properly. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. <clears throat> um, as for a curing unit, it's going to depend on whatever 510K you're um, like complying with, I guess. Um, so our system here at Wimix is three shape software. Um, our bare splint resin or uh, Keystone as well, right, Cherry? Yes, yeah. So we sell the the Keysoft um, and then our um, Vera Splint, which is a hard resin. Um, both of those resins are qualified for the Auto Flash. Um, that curing light's going to run you around thirty five hundred dollars. Um, and then you can also do a Cure Box Plus, which is just under a thousand. Um, there's two additional units from Uvitron, a, a Sunray and an Intelleray. Um, so really you just wanna kind of look and see what you're printing for class two medical devices and figure out which of those curing lights are gonna best suit your needs and kind of encompass your world. Um, you know, obviously with the CureBox Plus being under a thousand, it's very attractive, but one of the things um, to take into consideration is how long it takes to actually cure. Um, so in the CureBox Plus, it's 30 minutes on our Verisplint. Whereas in the auto flash, it's only going to take you 10 minutes to post process. Um, so if time is not an issue, the CureBox Plus is clearly um, a, a great option. But if time is an issue, then the auto flash would certainly be um, the better option of the two. Yeah, yeah. Um, we did have a, a question that came in. Where did it go? I lost it. There's my chat, my chat window. Shoot. Um, somebody, it was Barbara. I forget where. Yeah, somebody. she wants to know, um, after the primary wash, do you have to dry it and then do the secondary wash no. again then cure? You do not. No, you, you can you can take it right out of the right out of the um, the dirty wash and just plop it right down in the clean wash. Um, after the clean wash, yes, you need it needs to dry before it goes into the curing the curing unit. Um, that is and fortunately, you know, you want to be using 70% or greater, preferably 90% or greater isopropyl alcohol. Um, 
and it evaporates really, really quickly. So it'll literally, you can either use, you know, compressed air from your airline, or you can just let it air dry. It'll take like 30 seconds, maybe a minute to air dry. Um, and, yeah. and because you are um, changing out that alcohol, every single batch that you are cleaning, I recommend keeping it and transitioning it over to your, your clean bath and your dirty bath um, for your models or other things that you are cleaning that are not class two medical devices. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Good point. Um, so you're going to follow your manufacturer settings for your cure. Um, and then after your cure um, is when you're going to go ahead, you can remove your supports. Um, and really, honestly, you can remove your supports after the wash if you want to. Um, or you can remove them after the cure. I don't, I don't, I don't think that that is dependent on any kind of 510K. Um, you can really do it at any point. Um, when, you, when you remove the supports, um, you'll be able to just pinch those off, honestly. And you'll have like, you know, little nubs still left on your splint. Um, and what I recommend using are um, for your handpiece, you can get like the little scotch bright brushes, the little scotch bright wheels. Um, go with a, a coarse grain. Um, to remove the bulk of whatever's remaining of the supports and then use a fine grain um, to get those nice and smooth. And then as far as polishing goes, you can just do a traditional pumice and polish on these um, to get these nice and sparkly and crystal clear. So, All right. And someone did ask, um, can I wash the build plate with the appliances attached? The build plate doesn't fit well inside the Vera world. So um, actually, with the Astiga Max, that build plate will fit in to the top of that unit. Um, obviously, if you're using other printers, um, it's not really made to fit in the uh, in the Vera world. So, um, and then what is the curing and the auto flash cycles? So, um, on the auto flash, you're actually going to do the setting on that for six thousand flashes, which is going to take ten minutes. Now we also have another webinar that we had done previously um, on post-processing splints. If anyone wants me to get you a link to that, feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to get you the link. Um, we actually went through the whole polishing process and showing you how to get that glass-like look um, with your splints. Uh, let's see. Do you have a list of all the supplies and equipment, including software used for splints? Um, so Robert, yeah, we can certainly get you um, a list and provide you with an official quote as well so that you can have everything that you need um, in order to move forward and process splints. So someone uh, said, please send me the link. Um, if you would do me a favor, whoever wants a link, jot my email down. Um, it's S for Sherry. S Weatherby, W-E-A-T-H-E-R-B-Y at Whitmix.com. Shoot me an email and I am happy to um, provide you those links or answer any questions that you may have. Cool. All right. Is, that, is, that, is there anything else? I'll do one last check. Um, two more questions in the Q&A. Uh, Q and A panel. Let me see here. <clears throat> but the lid won't seat fully. Oh, that's okay. If the if, if you can't get the lid on when you're trying to when when the whole build plate is in, that that's fine. Um, it's not going to hurt anything to leave it open for for you know five minutes while it's washing. It's not a big deal. You can leave that open. <clears throat> and then Kent wanted to know what is the standard articulator settings. I think he's referring back to the three shape software. Standard articulator settings. Like what are the defaults for the for the articulator that's in that's preloaded? Maybe. Um, I think that might be what he wants, but can't you have my cell phone? Call me afterwards, and we'll get you answered up. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that one. Um. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's everything. Um, hey Bryce, Bryce, it's it's twelve o'clock, straight up. Um, I want to thank both of you for doing a great job, as always, of course. Uh, and Bryce, perhaps you can give your your uh, email address in case there's any technical questions that they didn't get in on time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, let me. I'll type it in. It's. Um, I'll type it into the comments as well. Uh, it's it's B and then my last name Hiller. So B H I L L E R at 
whipmix.com. Type it in there. If anybody has any questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, happy to happy to answer any questions you might have and um, anything I can do to to uh, get anybody up and running with splints. I'm more than happy to do. Uh, it's honestly it's a it's a it's a great appliance. It's a it's an easy add on item to protect your work, protect your doctor's work. Um, so so you know I, I recommend everybody look into it for sure if you're not already doing them. Hey, thanks everybody. Appreciate you joining us. And as a reminder, for those of you who are CDTs, uh, this is worth one hour towards your recertification. And uh, we're going to be sending you uh, a thank you letter, but also uh, a short test, which just to, for us to know that you were here uh, and watching. And then uh, we'll take care of getting a, a certificate to you. So thanks again. Uh, looking forward to having you again at a future with Mix webinar. Have a great day, y'all. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.